Right now, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker of the conference, Mr. Guy Kawasaki. Guy Kawasaki is the author of Enchantment, The Art of Changing Hearts, Minds, and Actions. He is also the co-founder of Alltop.com, an online magazine rack of popular topics on the web, and a founding partner of the Garage Technology Ventures. He is also a columnist for the Open Forum of American Express. Previously, he was the chief evangelist of Apple. In addition to Enchantment, Mr. Kawasaki is the author of nine other books, including, including Reality Check, The Art of Start, Rules for Revolutionaries, How to Drive Your Competition Crazy, Selling the Dream, and The Macintosh Way. Guy Kawasaki has a BA from Stanford University and an MBA from UCLA, as well as an honorary doctorate from Babson College. Mr. Kawasaki brings a unique combination of aspects from the corporate, business, and technological fields that will add to this conference. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Guy Kawasaki. <laughs> the software guy, software guy is always late, sorry. So good morning, my name is Guy Kawasaki, and um, you know, I speak about 75 times a year around the world, and typically a speaker says it's a real honor to be here. And I have to tell you, that's usually not true. Usually it's a pain in the butt to be here. <laughs> so I will tell you though, this is truly a king person honor to be here, because um, there's not many people who could say they spoke at the Naval Academy. So thank you very much for your hospitality. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it really is cool. This is, uh, is going to be a big event in social media. I'm going to put pictures all over the place. This is really going to be cool. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I have a speech today about the leadership skills that I learned from Steve Jobs, which is a, a very interesting topic for me. Uh, but before that, I'm going to show you some pictures that I have uh, taken or have had taken of me uh, that has to do with the Navy. Um, Believe it or not, I've served the Navy for exactly 48 hours. <laughs> so I'm going to show you pictures of my two days of service to the Navy. Uh, I, I was very, very lucky to uh, be on both the USS Stennis and the USS Nimitz. And, uh, I, and it wasn't just you know, when it was at a dock. I actually caught it on and off both ships. And there are not too many people who could say that in the world. Uh, so I, this is a rare occasion where I can use some of those pictures. So for those of you in the Navy, you know all about this kind of stuff, but for those of you who are not in the Navy, uh, let me show you what it's like. So the first thing you do is you go to San Diego, and they suit you up like this. And they tell you, you don't have anything to worry about. Just put this on. There's nothing going to happen. And then they put you in a plane, and this is basically the view. <laughs> And so they put you in this plane, and this is a butt-ugly plane. It's got propellers, and you're thinking, you know, what happened to Top Gun and Tom Cruise and all that kind of stuff? And they put you in this plane, an E2, and there's not exactly windows, you know? There's no movies. There's no meals. There's nothing. Uh, and, and, and you're looking backwards, and that's your view. And as soon as they start it up, you start seeing smoke coming out from underneath the seats, which is really water vapor. And you're beginning to get a sense that this is not your typical flight. Uh, it really is a disorienting thing. So this is at the Naval Air Station in San Diego. So you get in this plane, you're all suited up, and you go and you fly for about 45 minutes, and it's very noisy, and you can't do anything. You're stuck like this. And then you, all of a sudden they say, you know, you're going to land and boom, you go from, I don't know, 150 knots to zero in about 200 feet, which is not exactly United Airlines style of landing. <laughs> and then they open up the back and you look out and you see something like this. And you're beginning to have a sense that you're on another planet. And the door goes down a little bit more and then you see this. And then you step out and you finally you see something like this and it's very disoriented because now you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and it's hot and it's noisy and you see all these strange people with different colored jackets and you're wondering what the hell is going on here? And there's this smell of uh, fuel and uh, I've noticed with the people that I went on, on these things that there's sort of two reactions to the smell of fuel. Either you love the smell of fuel 
or you hate the smell of fuel. There's nothing in between. I happen to love the smell of jet fuel. I really, I think it's intoxicating. It's kind of this, really, 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 I, seriously. I, it's really, when you think about it, it's kind of the smell of freedom, if you will. And so, um, I was really, so then, and then they take you out and now you're in the middle of this and it is totally sorry and it's like you're on another planet and there's all this strange smoke flying around and they're telling you you can't go past this line and you're going to die if you go over here and, and you see these planes whipping down and there's these big cables catching these much bigger planes and you're wondering about the math of how can that cable stop a plane that's you know that big. There's a lot of things going on in your brain. Um, it's a very, very scary place. And, and then these things just go flying by, these F-18s that you know, you've only seen in movies. It's really a trip. I mean, thank you, US Navy, for having I've done this twice, so I was really, really privileged. Um, this is where I prefer to be, not near the action, uh, so I wouldn't get cut in half by the arresting cable. And uh, this is really the view. This is the view. And uh, they tell you, oh, don't worry. If your cod you know, misses or something, or it can't get, on, or when you leave, if it can't take off in time and you crash, these guys are in a helicopter, they'll get you right out of the water. Don't worry about a thing, guy. That makes me really feel happy that, you know, <laughs> I got these guys waiting up there just in case I die. Um, and this is a picture, uh, if you know Robert Scoble, he's a big social media blogger. Uh, he and I were on the deck there. And uh, they put you in a DV row, which is Distinguished Visitor's Row. So I thought, oh, this is going to be like the coolest place. This is like the Four Seasons of the Stennis or the Four Seasons of the Nimitz. Little did I realize that that's the Four Seasons here. <laughs> and not only is it cramped, shall I say, but I, apparently it's quite generous compared to everybody else, right? So this is really, you're lucky you got this. But somehow, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but the rooms for the distinguished visitors are right underneath the catapults, right? And it is arguably the noisiest place in the ship. It was amazing. And of course, the two times I was there, they decided they wanted to practice night landings all night. <laughs> so wow, I don't know how anybody sleeps on a boat. And um, you know, working for Apple and being in technology, we have iPhones and iPods and iPads, we have our toys, but man, the US Navy, they have toys. All right. <laughs> God, they took us into this place, they showed us all the bombs and all the rifles, man, that is, that's what you call hardware. <laughs> that is hardware, I love this, this is hardware. And these people in the back, the, the two women and this tall guy, this guy taking a the picture, these are all basic like West Coast liberal, uh, Democrat, anti-gun, anti-violence, anti-war, anti-everything. This is the first time they've ever seen a gun other than at Toys R Us plastic model. Um, it was really an eye-opening experience. And uh, this picture I took because it proves that no matter where you are, what service, what function, no matter what, the only thing that Windows is good for is solitaire. <laughs> This proves that. This proves that. Middle of the Pacific Ocean on this $10 billion aircraft and people are playing solitaire with windows. <laughs> and this, this, is what you, this is what the Navy refers to as LinkedIn. This is the links of the chain of the anchor. And I have to tell you, my friends here from the Navy, um, there are many, many impressive places on a carrier, but I think that the most impressive place is where the anchor uh, chain comes into the ship because it, I swear it was the cleanest part of the boat. I was truly amazed that, you know, you would think it would be one of the dirtiest parts of the boat because that anchor is going down into the ocean, you know, and coming back up. I was so impressed that it is so clean. That was the most impressive part of the boat for me. So this is LinkedIn Navy style. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So uh, my topic today is not my pictures of the Stennis or the Nimitz, and uh, instead it's about Steve Jobs. So let me tell you about Steve Jobs. Uh, I worked for Steve Jobs twice in my life. You know, the Japanese have a saying that uh, there's this mountain in Japan called Mount Fuji. 
very tall mountain, very hard to get to the top. It takes about 18 hours to climb to the top. And the Japanese have a saying that there's only two kinds of, well, if you climb to the top, you get this most incredible view of the countryside of Japan, okay? And the Japanese have a saying that there's only two kinds of fool. One fool never climbs to the top of Mount Fuji, never sees the view. The other kind of fool climbs twice. <laughs> I work for Steve Jobs twice. I'm that kind of fool. So uh, I worked in the Macintosh division from 1983 to 1987. This is during the introduction of Macintosh. Uh, the Macintosh division was arguably the greatest collection of egomaniacs in the history of California. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> Believe me, that's saying a lot. Um, because we worked for Steve, we had very special rules, unlimited supplies of fresh Odwalla juice at $3 a bottle. We had a great travel policy. The travel policy was that any flight over two hours qualified for first class travel. And this was the only division in Apple that had that travel policy. My interpretation of that rule was that the two hours begins at the moment you leave your apartment. <laughs> so I flew first class everywhere. I flew first class from San Francisco to Monterey. Um, we had a Bosendorfer Grand Piano for the division. We had a BMW motorcycle. Uh, we had a great time. We had a great time. We were on a mission from Steve to change the world. Back then, the company had two fundamental divisions, the Apple II division, which was shipping a boatload of Apple IIs, making tons of money, and the Macintosh division, which was still doing research, so we were spending a lot of money. If you looked at the Apple profit and loss statement back then, the profit was Apple II, the loss was Macintosh. And uh, yet, we were such bad people, we would not let Apple II division employees into our building. If you can imagine working for a company where one part of the company could not go into the building of the other part of the company. And then the Apple II people quickly figured it out. They were paying for a building that they were not being allowed into. So as you can imagine, that upset them. So they came up with a great joke about us, the Macintosh division, which is, how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. <laughs> Um, there is a Windows, a Microsoft version of this joke. How many Microsoft employees does it take to screen a light bulb? The answer is none, because Bill Gates has declared darkness the new standard. <laughs> so, so let me tell you my favorite story about Steve Jobs, so you can get a, a sort of glimpse into him. Um, so my job was to convince software companies to write software for Macintosh. This is before Macintosh really existed. Uh, it was a prototype, there was very poor documentation. You had to buy a $7,000 computer called a Lisa to program a Macintosh. So it was a big pain to write Macintosh software. So I had to overcome all that and convince companies to write software. So one day I'm sitting in my cube and Steve Jobs comes to my cube with this stranger and he asks me, Guy, have you heard of a company called Nowhere, K-N-O-W-A-R-E? And I said, yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, it was actually an educational software company, as in knowledge software forming Nowhere. So, I, so he says, well, what do you think of Nowhere? I said, well, I looked at it. It's kind of crappy software. It's character driven. doesn't use very much graphics. doesn't use a mouse very well. It's kind of 1970 technology. Really, it's kind of a piece of crap, Steve. What can I tell you? And then he turns to the other guy, and he says, says to me, guy, this is the CEO of Nowhere. <laughs> so welcome to my life. That's what it was like. Uh, I, I have nothing but the greatest admiration for Steve Jobs. He changed the world. And I don't think many people can say that. Uh, you know, in, in business anyway, the word visionary is thrown around very loosely. And in my mind, there's only been two visionaries in business. And it's Steve Jobs and Walt Disney. That's it. Everybody else is a wannabe. And so I consider it a privilege and an honor to have worked for him twice even. And uh, he changed the world. Um, you know, he changed the world with the Apple I, the Apple II. We'll just forget about the Apple III for a second. We'll forget about the Lisa for a second. Uh, then he changed the world with iPod, iPhone, iPad, arguably with iTunes. Uh, he changed the world about five times. And most people are lucky if they change the world once. He did it five times. There is no other person than Steve Jobs. Um, it's, the world is not as interesting a place without Steve Jobs. But I assure you that 
right now, he's telling God how to run the world. <laughs> so, let me tell you the lessons that I learned from Steve Jobs. Lesson number one is that pretty much the so-called experts in the world are clueless. The experts told Apple 40 or 50 times, you're dead. You can't succeed. Macintosh is a failure. No one will buy an iPod. It's the fifth MP3 player. Why would anybody buy an iPod? No one would buy an iPhone. No one would buy an iPad. Basically, every time Apple introduced something, the so-called experts said it would not work. The so-called experts said that Apple will die. And if Apple wants to succeed, Apple should buy Compaq or become Compaq. Michael Dell once told Steve Jobs that he should give back the money to the shareholders and close down Apple. So I'm not saying that, by definition, every expert is clueless. But for you young people who want to be leaders, you cannot take the word of experts as the gospel truth. You need to discover for yourself. You need to investigate these things. You should have a very skeptical attitude. Do not default to people who claim they are experts. Experts have been proven time and time to be clueless. Second thing is, I want to show you an example of some of this cluelessness. I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, an expert in computers, said this in 1943. Thomas Watson predicted that there would be a world market for five computers. I have five Macintoshes in my house. I have the entire world market for computers in my house today. Right? Imagine if people had listened to this and not done computers. Next thing. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. In 1876, Western Union wrote off telephony. Oops. <laughs> Western Union should be PayPal today. How many of you use PayPal? How many of you use Western Union? I rest my case. <laughs> Why isn't Western Union PayPal? Because Western Union could not jump curves. Western Union was successful on the telegraph curve. It rolled off the telephone curve. It didn't even make it to the internet curve. Experts are clueless. What was Western Union's major marketing direction in 1877? Perhaps it was going to be, let's teach Americans the Morse code. How hard could it be to teach Americans the Morse code? And then we could have a telegraph in every house. That's our strategic direction. Now, to be fair to Western Union in 1876, if you had the first telephone, who would you call? <laughs> they wrote off telephony in 1876. There is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, founder of DEC, said this in 1977. Ken Olson was a great entrepreneur, a great, great innovator. He made the mini computer business, but he could not embrace the next curve, which was the personal computer business. And you'll see this time and time again, that an innovator creates the sludge of his or her own bureaucracy, that you may be so successful as a mini computer manufacturer that you deny the next curve, the personal computer. Experts are clueless. Next thing is, customers cannot tell you what they want. They can tell you we want bigger, faster, cheaper Apple II, bigger, faster, cheaper Windows machine, bigger, faster, cheaper Nokia phone. Very few customers can tell you we want a small little graphics toy with a one button mouse, with icons, integration of text and graphics with no software. That's what Macintosh was. Pretty much when you ask people what they want, they will always define things in terms of what they already know. If they know an Apple II and you ask them what they want, they will say bigger, faster, cheaper Apple II. Very few customers are able to jump to the next curve. This is what we delivered. This is a Macintosh 128K. 
at the time it was considered remarkable. Graphical user interface, mouse driven, not cursor driven, completely different world. But no one was asking for something like this. This is the beauty and the genius of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs did not react to what the marketing told him to do. Steve Jobs created demand for things that he wanted to do. At Apple Computer, market research is the fact that Steve Jobs' left hemisphere of his brain was connected to the right hemisphere of his brain. That's the entire focus group. Macintosh 128K. Next thing is, ooh, the text got a little cut by your, it says jump to the next curve. What I learned from Steve is that yes, customers can't tell you what they want, so what you have to do is get to the next curve. This is how it works. So let me use a very good example, ICE. ICE 1.0. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was an ice harvesting business in this country. In 1900, as a, ma a matter of fact, something like nine million pounds of ice was harvested. They're gonna move, there you go. You need to expand your horizons. So, 1900, nine million pounds of ice was harvested. What was the ice harvesting business? It meant that Bubba and Junior would get this kind of cart, they would get a horse, and they would get a saw, and they would cut blocks of ice. Their idea of innovation was bigger, sharper saw, bigger cart, more horses. Ice 1.0. Ice 2.0 was the ice factory. Think of the advantage of the ice factory. Now it didn't have to be a cold city in a cold time of year. You could freeze water any city, any time of year. Hallelujah. This is a major, major technological breakthrough. No more waiting for winter. You could have an ice factory in Honolulu if you wanted. Ice 2.0. Ice 3.0 is the refrigerator curve. Now, instead of the ice man having to deliver ice to your house or going to the ice factory, you had your own personal ice factory. It was called a refrigerator, a PC, if you will, a personal chiller. <laughs> the very interesting historical lesson from these three examples of ice 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories and none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies and none of the refrigerator companies are biotech companies because most organizations start on the curve, stay on the curve, and die on the curve. Right? If you're an ice harvester, you think, ah, oh, I'm in the ice harvesting business. I use a saw and a sleigh and a horse. If you're an ice factory, you think I freeze water centrally, then I deliver the frozen water. If you're a refrigerator company, you think, I build these gizmos, and these gizmos go into people's homes. But what people have to do, and organizations have to do, is you have to step back from the process you're currently in and think about the benefit that you actually deliver. You're in the business of delivering benefits. As an ice harvester, you delivered the benefit of cleanliness and convenience, the ability to store food longer. Guess what? As an ice factory, you're in the same business. Cleanliness, convenience, store food longer. Guess what? In the refrigerator business, you're in the same business. Cleanliness, convenience, store food longer. All three curves are in the same business. But organizations tend to define themselves in terms of what they do, not the benefit they provide. And when you define yourself in terms of what you do, that's when you die. If you define yourself as making buggy whips, you do not embrace cars. You stay in the buggy whip business. Steve Jobs taught me that the big changes, the most exciting things, the most innovative, the most remarkable, the things that change the world happen because you don't stay on the same curve making things slightly better. It's because you got or invented the next curve. Next thing I learned from Steve Jobs is that the biggest challenges begets the best work. You know, many times you hear these organizational theories that you should give your people milestones and short little bite-sized challenges so they can accomplish something and feel like they've done something every day and have a lot of positive feedback. Um, you know, Steve Jobs was great in many things, but I would not say positive feedback, warm and fuzzy. Marcus Welby bedside manner was his strong point. Let's just put it that way. He gave us this huge challenge. At the time, 
we were competing with IBM. IBM was evil. IBM wanted totalitarianism to take over. IBM was the embodiment of George Orwell, 1984. Steve Jobs did not tell us we want to ship a few computers. Steve Jobs said we had to protect the world from totalitarianism and IBM. That's the challenge he gave us. And so when IBM entered the computer business, we welcomed IBM. Welcome to our world, a world of freedom and creativity and expression. That's the challenge that Steve gave us. Give people big challenges. Next thing I learned is that design truly counts. Truly counts. It might not count for everybody. To this day, only about 5% of the people use a Macintosh. In my humble opinion, the other 95% of the world must be oppressed. <laughs> because no one uses a Windows machine voluntarily. Design counts. Tell me you guys standardize on Windows here. Oppression. <laughs> Oppression. Had I known that, I might not have accepted this speech. <laughs> this is a MacBook Air. Oops, excuse me. This is a MacBook Air. It's thin, it's beautiful. You know, look at, look at the black, ugly laptops you're using. <laughs> Tell me about that. Why is that? This is beauty here. This is beauty. Design truly counts. Might not count for everybody. Not everybody might be able to afford it or have the ability to use it, but design counts. People care about design. Next thing, making presentations. Steve Jobs was just the best of making presentations. And I'll tell you something. Two key strategies of Steve that worked over and over again, I've seen Steve many times, is basically use big graphics and big fonts. Most people use small graphics and small fonts. I'll show you a typical Steve Jobs slide. This is a Steve Jobs slide. Notice the size of that Windows graphic. This thing is huge. The size of the text. iTunes is probably a 200 point font. The best Windows app ever written, probably a 100 point font. This is the embodiment of Steve Jobs. Big graphic, big font. It also shows a few other things. Who else but Steve Jobs would have the courage and the chutzpah to show his competition's logo in his keynote presentation and then say that something that Apple wrote was the best Windows application? That's Steve Jobs. If you want a rule of thumb for PowerPoint, because I know PowerPoint is used a lot, this is the Guy Kawasaki rule of PowerPoint. It's called the 10-20-30 rule. The optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10. Because it's hard to get more than 10 points across. You should be able to give those 10 points in 20 minutes. You may have a one hour slot, but let's face it, 95% of the world is using Windows. So those people need 40 minutes to make the projector work with the computer. <laughs> and then the ideal font size is 30 points, not 8, 10, or 12. If you use 8, 10, or 12, you're going to put a lot of text. If you put a lot of text, you're going to read the text. One slide into reading your text, your audience will figure out this guy is a bozo. This bozo is reading his slides verbatim. I can read silently to myself faster than this bozo can read them to me. I don't need to listen to him. All right? 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point slot. Now, some of you are very astute. You probably figured I use more than 10 slides already, right? And you're skeptical. You're looking at me with derision. I'll tell you something. I'll explain that. You're not me. <laughs> 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. If, if you want a rule of thumb for the font size, figure out who the oldest person will be in this audience. Divide the audience that age by two. That's your font size. So if you're pitching at 50, how old are you? <laughs> 29 point font. <laughs> Take the age, divide by two. Now, People are getting younger. Managers are getting younger. If you're pitching to a venture capitalist, venture capitalists are getting younger. Someday you may be pitching to a 16-year-old venture capitalist, 16-year-old manager, 16-year-old cadet, whatever it is, you know, midshipman, whatever it is. At that point, God bless you. Use the eight-point font. <laughs> but until that day, 
10 slides, 20 minutes, 30.5. Next thing, changing your mind is a sign of intelligence. Changing your mind is not a sign of wishy-washiness or lack of courage or lack of commitment. It's actually a sign of intelligence. Steve Jobs could change his mind. The beauty of Steve Jobs is not only could he change his mind, he could make you think he was right both times. <laughs> How many people can say that? I will show you a great example. This is a Steve Jobs quote. Our innovative approach using Web 2.0 based standards lets developers create amazing new applications while keeping the iPhone secure and reliable. When iPhone was introduced on 2007, June 11, Steve Jobs basically said with this, there will be no third party apps on iPhone. It's because the phone needs to be secure. So if you want to write any third party kind of functionality for an iPhone, you have to use web 2.0 based standards. Let me translate for you. That means you have to write Safari plugins, not standalone apps, stuff that plugs into our browser. And we're doing it for you. We're doing it as a favor to you. We're doing it because we're visionary, strategic people. It's because we want to keep your phone secure and reliable. Trust us. We're doing it for you. 2007. 2008. Apple executives to showcase Mac OS X Leopard and OS X iPhone development platforms worldwide developer conference 2008 keynote. One year later, Steve Jobs is announcing we have a platform for you to develop third-party apps. This is an open system now. We want hundreds of thousands of open apps. We want apps that simulate farting. We want apps that simulate whatever you want. We want apps for movies, for TV, for whatever you want. We want apps to measure things that you can attach and take your blood pressure, that you can hold in your hand or take your pulse. We want apps for everything. We want a hundred flowers to blossom to create, to quote Mao. So in one year, basically, Steve Jobs went 180, 180 degrees. We want phones to be secure and safe, no apps. Two, we want there to be thousands of apps. We're giving you a platform to develop. And you know what? This is the beauty of Steve Jobs. The first time he said that, we said, yes, yeah, Steve, thank you for making our phones secure and safe. A year later, we said, yeah, thank you, Steve, for making it so flexible so we can have more apps. Both times, people said, wow, he's a genius. <laughs> That's the beauty of Steve Jobs. My take on this is that it's a sign of intelligence that he was able to change his mind. That he saw that if iPhone were truly going to do everything that people wanted, Apple computer could not write every app. That he had to open up the system, so he reversed himself. Don't be afraid of reversing yourself. Next thing I learned from Steve Jobs is that value is different than price. You know, I don't think anybody, anybody bought a Macintosh because it was cheaper. People buy Macintoshes because of the value of it. What's the difference between value and price? Price is a number. It's $2,000. Value takes into account what a Macintosh can do. How much does it cost to set it up, to be trained on it, to convert to it, to use it? What kind of apps are there? Does it make you more creative and more productive? When you figure all that kind of stuff in, I would say the value of a Macintosh is higher than competing platforms. This is a screen from an ad where this is the PC guy on the left, the Mac guy on the right, and the PC guy on the left is holding a bake sale because he needs to raise money to fix Windows XP. And Windows XP had a lot of bugs. It was cheaper than Macintosh. A computer running Windows XP was cheaper than Macintosh. But what was the value of it? The pain of those bugs, the pain of learning it, the pain of getting to that platform. Steve Jobs taught me, guy, price is different from value. Go for value. Next thing I learned from Steve Jobs is that A players hire A players. I translated this to A players hire A plus players. The theory of the Macintosh division was that if you're an A player, you should hire someone as good as you. However, if you're an A player and you hire someone as good as you, then everybody will be good. The problem occurs if you're a B player. 
because the B player typically is insecure and hires a C player so that you can feel better than that person. Then you hire the C player. Now the C player, what does he do or she do? He or she hires a D player. What does the D player do? The D player hires the E player. So after a while, after a while, you are surrounded by Z players. This is called the bozo explosion. <laughs> you need to fight the bozo explosion. And the way to fight the bozo explosion is to be secure in your ability and hire people who are better than you. To work with people who are better than you. That's why I say A players hire A plus players, people who are better than themselves. If you are the best engineer, you should hire someone who can do marketing better than you, not worse than you. This is a picture of the Macintosh division 25 years after the announcement of Macintosh. And these are the folks who created Macintosh, uh, a motley crew at best. But uh, I'll show you some famous people. This is Steve Capps. He wrote The Finder. Uh, Mike Boyce is the original uh, software evangelist. Uh, at this point, Steve Jobs was already very ill, so he did not come to this particular reunion. Um, this gentleman here, that very few people know, his name is James Higa. And James Higa is the person who wrestled six music title labels to the ground and made them sell songs for 99 cents. So if it wasn't for James Higa wrestling those six titles to the ground for iTunes, iPod might not be a success. Uh, very few people know that. He is the man. Because I don't know how you would go to six big, dumb, rich music companies like that and wrestle them through the ground. Uh, that was a Herculean task. So these were A-plus players. Uh, uh, it was really just the greatest experience to work with them. Next thing that I learned from Steve Jobs is that real CEOs can demo the product can fly the plane, can pilot the boat. They can really do it. They're not just talk. They're not just strategy. They're tactics. Steve Jobs could do a demo. Very, very few high-tech CEOs can demo their own products. In order to demo your own product, it takes two things. You need to know the product. And secondly, you need to know the customer. Because you can't really do a good demo unless you know what people are looking for in the product. This is a picture of Steve Jobs when he first introduced Macintosh. He brought it out on a stage at De Anza College. He lifted it out of a bag. The Macintosh was speaking back then. We had something called speech synthesis. And it said, you know, boy, it's great to get out of this bag. <laughs> and he shoved that disc in it, and the rest is history. Steve Jobs introduced Macintosh. Steve Jobs did not stand on the stage and say, now nah, I'll let my vice president of R&D do the demo. Steve Jobs did the demo. Real CEOs do the demo. Next thing I learned is that real entrepreneurs also ship. They don't try to make a perfect product. You know, the first ice factory probably wasn't perfect. The first refrigerator company wasn't perfect. If you look at the curves of the printer business, there was daisy wheel printers. Many of you are too young to know what a daisy wheel printer is. But a daisy wheel printer had a little thing on it that had all the letters on it that spun around and it struck the paper. Right? So the curve from daisy wheel printer, next curve is laser printer. The first laser printer was flawed. $7,000. Very slow network, single-sided printing, only one si so the size of paper. Lots of flaws to it. But it was already so great that it was OK to ship it because it was so much better than the best daisy wheel printer. The lesson you have to learn here is that real entrepreneurs ship. It's not about research and development. It is about shipping to get the product out. This is the difference between Apple and Xerox Park. Xerox Park had many of the ideas for Macintosh, but they could not ship. They were more research than they were marketing. Real entrepreneurs ship. This is a picture of the Xerox Park machine. It had a mouse, graphical user interface, lots of the things that became Macintosh. Real entrepreneurs ship. Next thing I learned is that marketing equals unique value. 
All of marketing boils down to this. Whether you're in the US Navy, or whether you're at Apple, or Google, or Cisco, or Yahoo, or YouTube. This is marketing. Marketing equals unique value. I'll go over this. This is a two by two matrix. On this vertical axis, we measure uniqueness. On this horizontal axis, we measure value. This is a two by two matrix. God help you, if you ever work for McKinsey, you'll learn that in a two by two matrix, you always want to be in the upper right hand corner. That's it. That's all you need to do to work at McKinsey. So, let me go through the, the four corners of this. In the bottom, have you hired McKinsey for the Navy? Is that why you're laughing? <laughs> now, come on, be honest. Your tax dollars at work. So, oops. In this corner, this is the corner where you have something that's valuable. It's useful. But it is not unique. It's very low on the unique scale. Right? If you slap the same operating system on the same hardware, it's valuable. But it's not unique. You can buy a Dell or a Gateway or an HP or a Lenovo. You have to compete on price. It's not the worst place to be. Dell made billions of dollars here, but it's always about price. In the opposite corner, this is a corner where only you do something. Only you do it. It's unique, but it's not value. In that corner, you're just stupid. <laughs> you own a market that doesn't exist. In this corner, this is the worst corner. This is the corner where you're doing something that's not valuable and not unique. That's called the dot-com corner. The dot-com corner, let me explain. Let me use an example. I hope you remember a company called Pets.com. How many remember Pets.com? Please say you remember Pets.com. Well, for those of you who don't remember, Pets.com was selling dog food online. Well, let me give you the pitch for Pets.com. There are 300 million Americans. One in four owns a dog, 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. That's 150 million cans of dog food per day, total addressable market. How hard could it be to sell just 1% of 150 million cans of dog food per day? That's one and a half million cans per day. Worst case, conservatively speaking, we will make $1 per can of dog food. Worst case. Conservatively speaking, we will make one and a half million dollars per day. And the dog food business is a good business because dogs eat every day. <laughs> they don't take the weekends off. <laughs> so multiply 365 by 1.5, and that's a conservative, worst case, first year sales. Let me explain why Pets.com should exist. The pet food business is a very simple business. We have a dog. And we have a cow. We need to kill the cow, cut it up, put it in a can, get it to the dog. That's the dog food business, supply chain manager. Okay? <laughs> but in this supply chain, there's this stupid brick and mortar thing called the dog food store. People have to get in their car, drive to the dog food store, find parking, go inside the dog food store, pick up a case, put it back in their car, drive home, give it to you know, Rocky, their dog. That's so inefficient. Why do people have to get in their car, find a parking space, go to the store? W what purpose does the dog food store serve? Is it point of purchase decision making? Do you go to the dog food store and taste the various forms of dead cows in cans? No, it's dead cows in cans. So let's change this business. Let's remove the dog food store. And we can give everybody a 25% discount on dog food. Hallelujah. Call up Goldman Sachs. File for the IPO. This is revolutionary. Patent pending. Way to tap 75 million dogs in America eating two cans of dog food per day. Conservatively speaking, 1%, one and a half million cans of dog food per day. Hallelujah. There's only one problem. Actually, there's two problems with the dog food business. First of all, dead cows in cans weigh a lot. So you may discount the dead cow in the can, but then if people aren't picking it up, you have to ship it to them. And if you ship it to them, you have to throw in shipping and handling. So the shipping and handling became equal to the discount you would have given them. So effectively, you save no money by buying dead cows in cans online. Also, when the dead cow in the can came to your house, somebody had to be at home. So it's less convenient and just as expensive. Ergo, it's not valuable.
Then, stupid people like me in the venture capital business, we saw that one venture capital firm had a pets.com in that portfolio. So we thought, oh, we need our pets.com. So that's why there was epets.com, ipets.com, lastinapets.com, discountpets.com. There are 10 ways to spend as much for dead cows in cans at the dog food store as online. So it was not valuable and it was not unique. That's the dot com business. So the corner you want to be in is this corner, the upper right hand corner, where you provide a unique service that's valuable. A unique service that's valuable. This is my bonus to you. My bonus to you is I think the greatest lesson that I learned from Steve Jobs is that unlike skeptics who say that you know, if you want me to believe something, I need to see it. Seeing is believing. Truly, I believe the world works in the opposite way, which is if you believe, then you will see. If you believe in Macintosh, you will see a Macintosh. If you believe in Macintosh, so you, I, my pitch to software developers were, if you believe in Macintosh enough, if you write software for Macintosh, we can make Macintosh successful. So if we believe it, we will see it. And in technology and innovation, the way it works is you have to believe before you can see. Steve Jobs believed in a phone, in a phone with a battery that would not last one day, with no real keyboard when everybody was using a Blackberry. Steve Jobs believed and he made other people believe and other people wrote apps and other people bought it as early adopters and he embraced it and he made the iPhone reality. And he did it over and over again. Macintosh, iPhone, iPod, iPad. The greatest lesson that I learned from Steve Jobs is if you truly want to be innovative, if you truly want to change the world, you need to believe before you can see. And I have one more slide. And this last slide, you know, as I said, I visited the USS Stennis and the USS uh, Nimitz. And this was actually at sea, so I, you know, as you heard, I caught it in and out. And I, 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 I was really, I can't, this is some of the happiest days of my life were on that ship. I have to tell you, it was really, you know, although the Air Force once put me in an F-15, that was pretty heavy too, but, but I'm open for an F-18 ride anytime you want. But I, I have to say that, you know, when I was on the Stennis and the Nimitz, I looked at that and I said, wow, look at these 18-year-old kids. You know, they're running this $27 million jet or they're, they're underneath of that cable room, you know, and there's like some 18-year-old kid calling the shots in that cable room and it, and it is just amazing to me. And I have to tell you, after those two trips to the Stennis and the Nimitz, I slept better at night knowing that there are people like you out there in the world. I truly, truly did. So my last picture is this, this bit to depict what I think truly stands for leadership because I'll tell you something, coming from Silicon Valley and technology, I don't know anybody in my business who could do what you guys do, really. I truly mean that. And so this is my picture. This is true leadership, baby. <laughs> if you can sit in that chair, you are a leader. You can kick Steve Jobs' butt. Trust me when I tell you, this is a great chair. This is the chair. This is leadership. You know, for those of you from the Naval Academy, the other military academies, I thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really do sleep better knowing that you're out there. For the rest of you students, I hope you learn something about leadership. I hope you take it back to your schools. I hope that you show people how to jump curves and change the world because that's what it's at, where it's at. And always remember, some things need to be believed to be seen. That's the greatest lesson of Steve Jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Um, I heard you want to ask me questions, so I got, I'm back. <laughs> so, so what can I do for you? Anybody got a question? Where? Oh, yes. Oh, go to the mic. Uh, Mr. Kawasaki, I want to thank you on this excellent lecture. Uh, my name is Mark Bell, and I'm a midshipman at the NROTC program at the University of Texas. Um, University I, of Texas? Yes, a, sir. Okay. You no, know you're not in an ocean. 
Sorry? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> detailed, we know detailed. You. Some things need to be believed to be seen. Yes, sir. <laughs> Um, I have a question about as organizations progress, because as Apple has reached maturity, it's still managed to maintain the sort of innovative spirit. And you yeah. mentioned hiring A-plus players. Um, but within the Navy, as we see, you know, it's a mature organization, and we still hope to foster that sort of innovation. That's what our CEO talked about. How do you keep that sort of, you know, underdog entrepreneurship spirit, even if you have established the most valuable company in the world? Yeah. Um, I, I think the key to that is that it comes from the top, really. It comes from, does, you know, Steve Jobs never rested, never rested. And I think that the top of the organization has to set the pace. And so it is incumbent upon the management, the top, at the top, to keep that going. And it is the hardest thing to do, trust me when I tell you. And so, um, you know, an organization reflects its CEO in, its, in this case. And you know, that's the key comes from the top. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. What else? Oh, go to the, wherever, wherever you are, go to the mic. So. Oh, <laughs> I guess there's no mic up there. Like solitaire? <laughs> like solitaire? Yeah, I, you know, I, I have never been a big gamer. Um, and particularly, I'm not a big gamer now because I have four children, so my life is a game. Um, you know, Apple, well, and also, I've been out of Apple for 10 years now, so I can't exactly speak as if I represent them. But Apple is in the business of providing a very powerful, easy-to-use platform. And they have this attitude of, you know, letting 100 flowers blossom, which means that, you know, whatever people want to do with it, they do with it. I can't tell you that Apple is intentionally trying to create a gaming machine, uh, but theoretically, if it provides a really powerful, easy to use platform that's easy to program for, gamers will embrace it. Um, but I, 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 I cannot tell you that you know, back in 1983 and 1984, we were trying to make a gaming platform. We were trying to make a productivity platform. and. Uh, but you know, people take a computer as a platform into directions of their own. So that's a long way of evading your answer. Um, <laughs> I really, it's, it's, it's to provide a platform and let people have at it, really. That's the attitude. OK? What else? Is that my camera? Yeah? Can I borrow? What else? Sir? Yes. Um, good morning, sir. I'm Rishan, sir. I'm from Tufts University. Um, just to play the you're devil's from, you're from Tufts? I'm from Tufts, sir. Is that this university where they have the, um, the elephant? Yes. Jumbo. Yeah. And th there's, yeah. Also, there's also a cannon <laughs> covered with paint there, right? Every single day is changing. Yeah, what's changes. with that? Um, I think it's a cannon from, it's a replica of one of the cannons from the Constitution, uh. the US Constitution. And, um, if you're a student group and you want to have, uh, you know, you want to make an announcement, you go at night, you paint it, okay. and you guard it till 4 a.m. Uh -huh. So no one else goes and paints it. <laughs> so every morning you go and see, you know, it's like um, okay. Tufts, Tufts Union for this or for that. So that's just pretty cool. Okay. Um, so anyway, so just to play um, the devil's advocate a bit on what you've been saying, Apple and, you know, it's 100 flowers um, attitude. We all know how the 100 flowers program ended when people said things that, you know, um, Mao's government didn't like, they clamped down. Yes. And I think, you know, I, it just brings to mind the, the recent controversy with, I think, Siri, and how, you know, you couldn't ask for directions to an abortion clinic, for example. You know, would you say that there's that kind of, um, you know, you want to be open, but you need to maintain, you know, what your company believes in. How do you juggle the two, you know? You make sure that you know, you're flexible and you're open, but you yeah, need yeah. to stay true. Okay. You believe it. So, um, when Chairman Mao said, let 100 flowers blossom, he didn't say, and then I'll crush them. <laughs> Which is actually what he did, right? Uh, so I only quote the first part of that. And I actually do it, actually I spoke in China, and I really have to think if I should quote that. 
because I would like to have left China too. Um, so, uh, so my, I, I still say that, well, you may find quoting Mao slightly bizarre, but that is a great way of expressing what I want to say, which is you should let a hundred flowers blossom. And you know, this gentleman wants a gaming machine, someone else wants a graphics machine, someone else wants a spreadsheet machine, hallelujah. Provide a great platform, let a hundred flowers blossom. Um, it is also a business recommendation for entrepreneurs that you, know, you may think you have a spreadsheet database and word processing computer, but really what the world wants to use your computer for is desktop publishing. And so Apple Computer did not design desktop publishing. Apple Computer benefited from all this making a product called PageMaker. And arguably without PageMaker creating desktop publishing, Apple would have died. And if Apple died, well, we'd all have phones that would lasted more than a day with a real keyboard. It would be a different world. And so, you know, I think that all this PageMaker was a gift from God to Apple. I really do. It saved Apple. And I believe in God. One of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of God. <laughs> so, so to get to your question, you know, I would err in the, in the side of too open, too free. That I think it's better. It's better than too controlling. If, if you have to pick one, let a hundred flowers blossom. I'm not saying let a hundred flowers blossom in order to find out who the revolutionaries are and kill them. I'm just saying let a hundred flowers blossom. It is, it's, it's, you could argue that, you know, that is a great force for political change. That people's spirit and independence and entrepreneurship is irrepressible. I mean, that dog don't hunt. You can't stop that. So, no. Asking Siri where the abortion clinic is, I mean, you know, no, I, you know, I can't tell you that I lay awake at night about that. I mean, that's, yeah. I, I don't know how you would, that, that's such a, we could spend a whole hour on that topic. That, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. What else? Yes. Uh, hello, sir. Um, my name is Joel. I'm also from Tufts University. About the uh, canon, that's actually how we uh, keep our eye on some of the more minor institutions down in Cambridge, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in regards to, um, your point about not believing in the experts. Uh, experts are called as such because, well, they're very often right about things. And when somebody has an idea which, uh, which is uh, criticized by expert, expert opinions, everybody obviously wants to believe that they're going to be the exception. And, well, statistically speaking, it's uh, very likely that they're not going to be. So right. how do how do you, how did Steve Jobs, how do you, the other visionaries you've worked with um, identify the, the problem? Yes. All right. So the fact that experts are clueless and could be wrong about you should empower you to still believe in your dream. I am not telling you that whenever people say you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. I wish that were the case. <laughs> it's not that easy. But if people tell you you'll fail and you believe them so you don't even try, you will never know. And that is true failure. And I would say mathematically you are correct. That, you know, in the venture capital business, you know, oh, you know, you're lucky if one out of 20 of your companies succeeds. So I could look at any venture capital portfolio and say, most of your investments will not work, and I will be statistically right. However, life is not a game of telling you what will fail. Life is a game of trying to find out one out of 20 that will succeed. And so, you know, it, it really is a matter of personal philosophy and perspective. And if you want to go around just saying you'll fail, you'll fail, you'll fail, 19 out of 20 times you'll be right. But one out of 20 times you'll be wrong, and that person will change the world. So, that's just the way the world works. I wish I could tell you that 19 out of 20 times people are successful. It's not true. But if you, if you just look at the math and never try, you'll never know. And that truly is failure. So it's easy for me to say about you know, something that you might want to try. But I'll tell you, I'll give you some classic examples. So let's say you're a venture capitalist. Or let's say you're an expert. And I'll tell you what you deal with. So, Two guys come to you and they say, we need infinite bandwidth 
with infinite storage space and we're going to enable people to upload stolen copyrighted video and our tipping point will be when people start dropping Mentos into Diet Cokes. How many of you think YouTube would succeed? Because that's what I just described, YouTube, right? If you are Larry Page and Sergey Brin and you're starting the sixth search engine, it was already Yahoo and Inc. to me and Alta Vista. Did the world need another search engine that measured inbound links? Probably not, but that's Google. And so if you look at case after case after case of great tech successes, it's people who would not listen to experts. The experts would have told YouTube it'll never work. Twitter, how many of you use Twitter? Okay, so Twitter, let's say it's six years ago and somebody says, well, I'm going to create this service where you can send out 140 character text messages to the world and you can send out a message like, the line at Starbucks is long. <laughs> My cat rolled over. <laughs> Southwest Airlines is late, right? But someday, someday, Twitter is going to be so powerful, it's going to bring down governments. Who would have thought that? And so I can't tell you that every time you say something will fail, will succeed, but you have to try. You really have to try. That's the only way to do it. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why young people make the best entrepreneurs. It's because, by definition, you don't know what you don't know. If you knew what I knew, you would never try. If you had four kids like I do, you would never try. If you had a mortgage and car payments, you would never try. You have nothing to lose. Your parents and your grandparents for generations have been working hard, right? I don't know, they came over and, you know, they started mowing lawns and then they went and ran a 7-Eleven and they scrimped and saved and then, you know, maybe your father was a doctor but his grandfather ran a 7-Eleven and now your father's a doctor and they're sending you to Tufts, right? So you have a moral obligation to live off your family as long as possible. Right? <laughs> They work for hundreds of years to get you to the point where you are. I'll remind them of that. <laughs> Tell them to call me. Just don't have my son cop this logic. So, so you have a moral obligation while you're young and you have no kids, no mortgage, no house. Roll the dice. Roll the dice. You are, you know, um, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, and believe me, I don't know how I got into Stanford to this day, but I did. Well, back then, Asians were oppressed. Um, <laughs> seriously, seriously, I was oppressed. Why not? You white people, you know, you make me like wash your laundry and stuff. Anyway, so build your railroad, wash your laundry. So you have to put me in Stanford with all that guilt. So, so when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, listen to this. I was an undergraduate at Stanford. I love to play basketball. So we would play basketball outdoors and there would be this thing called family day. And on family day, everybody's family came in and visited their you know, precious little Johnny and Susie's, right? And so the, the, the Stanford families from California, they would drive in and they would drive in and they would pull up in these Porsches and Mercedes and BMWs and Mercedes. And I would look at those Porsches and I'd say, wow, someday I'm going to be rich enough to have a Porsche, okay? Fast forward about 25 years. I still play basketball at Stanford. And I would be out there, so I would pull up in my Porsche, park on the road, play outdoor court. And I know all those kids are looking at me saying, someday I'm going to be rich like that guy and I'm going to drive a Porsche. But the irony is, that day when I pulled up in my Porsche to drive, uh, pull up in my Porsche to play basketball at Stanford, I looked at those kids, I look at you. I say, wow, I wish I was young again. I wish I was young again. I wish the only thing I had to worry about was midterms. <laughs> and I wish I could be back then. So it's just a long story to tell you, you're a good part of your life. <laughs> Trust me. Enjoy it. Roll the dice. Roll the dice. Thanks very much. Thank How about one last question? Because what time am I supposed to end? I forgot. Yeah? One more question. One more question. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Fielding. I am from uh, Hampton University. 
Finally, nice. someone not from Tufts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just had a quick question. Uh, could you tell me why my phone battery dies so fast? <laughs> no, because but it's I, easy to use. That's why. <laughs> Pick one, long lasting, easy to use. <laughs> uh, but on a more serious note, um, I know that oftentimes as leaders we have to uh, function in a conservative manner, but I'll, it's kind of necessary to have a liberal mindset, if you will. I was wondering if you could uh, give some advice or suggestion about how to kind of fuse the two in the best capacity, if you will. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I wrote a book called Enchantment. And one chapter in Enchantment is how to enchant people who work for you. So I'll give you the gist of that chapter. Uh, I, I think the key to enchanting people who work for you is that you provide them with what I call a map, M-A-P. This is the work of Daniel Pink, just to give credit to the actual source. So M-A-P, the M stands for mastery. So what you're telling people is if you work for me, you come under my command, you will master new skills. The A stands for autonomy. You will master new skills while working autonomously, independently. I'm not going to be breathing down your neck. And the P stands for purpose, that we have a higher purpose in this organization than simply making a buck or showing up for work. So you tell people who work for you, if you want to enchant them, come work for me, you'll master new skills, working autonomously towards a higher purpose. That's the map. Second thing I would do is I would empower people. I would say to people, I think you're smart, I think you're good, I empower you to make the right decision for our customer. You don't have to check everything with me. And the final thing, I'd like to offer you a real hero, which is Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs. How many of you watch Dirty Jobs? Dirty Jobs is a great show, enchanting show. What makes Dirty Jobs enchanting? It's that Mike Rowe will do the dirty job. He will go into the paint factory, the poi factory. He'll clean the outside of a skyscraper. He'll go underneath the house and dig out the dead rats. He'll go into the sewer and get all the crap out of the sewer that's blocking the sewer. He'll perform artificial insemination on turkeys. He will do whatever <laughs> it takes. You want to be an enchanting boss? You know, you want to put together this, this both control but yes, yet liberal freedom? You have to show people that work for you that you are willing to do the dirty job and that you never ask people to do something that you yourself would not do. And that would be the key to enchanting people. Thank you. Okay? Thank you very much. And if, um, if that was really a standing ovation, you weren't standing up to leave, could you do that one more time so that I could take a picture and say, see, I got a standing ovation in the Naval Academy. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sir, on behalf of the United States Naval Academy Leadership Conference, we'd like to present you this gift. Coming back? <laughs> I'm never getting away. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you. Is it what I think it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. I hope it's a hockey jersey. Yeah. It's an autograph hockey jersey. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.